My name is Alexis Jetter. I teach journalism in the English department here at Dartmouth. Uh, I want to welcome you to what I think is the 16th annual Bernard Nossiter Lecture, sponsored by the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy. We got all that right. Um, we're honored today to have as our speaker Mariah Blake, uh, an award-winning investigative reporter for uh, The Atlantic Magazine, Mother Jones, The New Republic, Foreign Policy, The Washington Monthly, and several other publications. Mariah's scope and versatility are remarkable. In the last year alone, or maybe a year and a half, um, she's exposed deadly pollution in a West Virginia town, a topic she'll be talking about today. Profiled the women who love the men's rights movement, in a really amazing and funny and troubling piece. Tracked the star of Duck Dynasty as he helped mobilize the Christian right. Followed the money trail to show how American taxpayer money was used to fund the Uganda death to the gays law. And if your value as a journalist is measured by the enemies you make, Mariah's in very good company. <laughs> She's been attacked by the leaders of the Manosphere, the men's rights movement, uh, who say that she offers up the same tripe as every other second-rate blogger in the yellow world of online feminism. And I'll let Mariah speak to that. Um, but uh, despite that attack, uh, Mariah's pieces are not hit pieces by any stretch. They're deeply researched stories that she roots in history, in science, and detailed human stories, some of which you'll see here today, um, that she's exquisitely um, interwoven into her pieces. And I really urge you, she'll be talking about the piece uh, Welcome to beautiful Parkersburg, West Virginia here today. I really urge you to read it. I urge you to read it in print and I urge you to read it online because it's one of those wonderful multimedia productions where you get to actually see and hear people directly. Um, by the way, this piece, Welcome to beautiful Parkersburg, West Virginia, um, Mariah is working and expanding into a book and uh, it's already been optioned by a division of Sony Pictures for a feature length film. So things are looking good. Um, in her most recent work, Mariah has covered what she calls the nexus between policy and science and has written on a wide variety of topics ranging from the plastic industry's embrace of tobacco industry style tactics to corruption in the medical supply industry and the rise of faith-based news organizations. At Harvard's Neiman Foundation, um, where she's currently a fellow, and Neiman, for those who don't know it, um, gives the world's top journalists a year to research and relax also from daily deadlines. Mariah is studying the intersection of science and US government policy, focusing specifically on how some corporations and special interests exploit loopholes and magnify scientific uncertainty to shape policies to their advantage. And I'm sure you're all aware of the uncertainty debate about climate change. Uh, Mariah's expanded that to other areas, including uh, plastics. I'm personally thrilled uh, that Mariah is with us today. I'm particularly eager to hear what you have to say about the role of the plastics industry in masking its deadly legacy in towns and cities across the U.S. and abroad. And I would just add parenthetically that my students who are here in my journalism class, we've read, um, oh my God, Silent Spring, uh, or parts of it. So there are some elements of your own work. Uh, and I'm forgetting the author of Silent Spring, Rachel Carson, um, in, in so uh, you would what people call a daughter of Rachel in the work that you're doing. I think you're in very fine company. Um, before uh, Mariah takes the stage, though, I want to take a moment to thank the Nossiter family who created this lecture series in 1994 to encourage brave and independent journalism among undergraduate students. Bernard Nossiter uh, was an award-winning foreign correspondent for the Washington Post. He was the United Nations Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and he graduated from Dartmouth in 1947. Three of his four children, three of his four sons did as well. The holdout, Adam Nossiter, you may recognize, he was the longtime East Africa Bureau Chief for the New York Times, and he now reports from Paris. Uh, the family, along with Dartmouth history professor Michael Ermart, who's here, and classics professor Edward Bradley, who's here, uh, each of whom taught some of the Nossiter sons, each year selected journalist who embodies Bernard Nossiter's commitment to courageous journalism and masterful writing. 
His own work spanned the globe and included in a story I just uncovered, or discovered, um, that he summarized the entire Pentagon Papers for the Washington Post, which for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, it was an enormous trove of previously classified documents that revealed for the first time the atrocities and lies and mismanagement that several U.S. presidents and military chiefs had covered up about the U.S. war in Vietnam. I think Mar Mariah and Bernard, uh, known as Bud, have that passion in common to expose the inconvenient truths that we must know so that we can protect our environment, our health, and our human rights. So without any more, I'm honored to introduce Mariah Blake. Thank you, Alexis, for that wonderful introduction. So most of you in the room are probably familiar with the epic drama surrounding big tobacco. And I'm going to be talking about some similar strategies today. So armed with billions of dollars, tobacco companies um, attacked the science showing smoking causes cancer. This strategy was remarkably effective in keeping cigarettes from reg regulation and keeping smokers hooked on deadly products, at least until the 1990s when the scheme crumbled. I'm going to talk about another industry that has been just as instrumental in pioneering the tactics that corporations use to wage war on science, uh, but this industry has used these tactics even more successfully, and the industry I'm talking about is chemicals and plastics. So since the 1950s, companies like DuPont and Monsanto have been engaged in a stealth campaign to cover up the dangers of everyday products, products like vinyl, Teflon, styrofoam, dioxins. In the meantime, these materials have become so ubiquitous that we can't envision life without them. Our society is literally built on these substances. Our homes are overflowing with them. Our bodies are overflowing with their chemical residues. The scheme has real consequences for ordinary people. So this is a man named Bucky Bailey. I met him when I was reporting the story that Alexis referred to called Welcome to Beautiful Parkersburg, West Virginia. In the 1980s, Bucky's mother Sue worked at the DuPont plant in Parkersburg. And shortly after she got pregnant with Bucky, she got transferred to the Teflon division, which makes Teflon plastic coating. Right after the transfer, Sue started feeling extremely anxious and nauseated, and she began to suspect that something was seriously wrong, and in fact, something, something was. When she gave birth to Bucky in January 1981, he had only half a nose, and his lower eyelid was so ragged and loose that it hung down to the middle of his cheek. This is a picture of Bucky as a baby, and this is actually after he'd had several corrective surgeries. Um, initially, Sue Sue's uh, doctor warned that Bucky might not even survive through the first night. Now, at first, Sue thought that Bucky's deformities were just a matter of bad luck, that she had somehow lost the genetic lottery. Uh, but then she returned to work, and she found a memo on the locker room bench. The memo described a recent industry-funded study that had found deformities in the eyes and nostrils of rats exposed to a chemical called C8 in, in utero. Now. Um, C8 is the substance that gives Teflon its nonstick qualities, but it's also found in thousands of other household items, plastics, food wrappers, uh, dental floss, kitty litter, basically anything that's waterproof, stainproof, or nonstick at one point had C8 in it. Now, according to the memo, female workers who came into contact with C8 should, quote, consult their doctors before contemplating pregnancy. Sue began to wonder if this chemical might be to blame for the birth defects in her son. And I'm going to play a video, a video of you, a video of Sue talking about her experience. So Sue didn't know it at the time, but DuPont had been secretly monitoring her pregnancy and it had been secretly monitoring more than 50 women. I'm going to show you a memo about the program from DuPont's then medical director, and I hope you can read it. Um, the highlighted part says, you'll see the, the goal of the program was to determine whether C8 caused, quote, abnormal children. And the results of the study were pretty stunning. Two of the seven women who gave birth in the first months of the program had children who had deformities very similar to those that were found in rats. 
um, in the C8 studies. Now, du DuPont concluded that the chemical was probably to blame for, for the defects, for the deformities in these, in these human children, uh, but it didn't inform workers or regulators, as it should have by law. It just quietly killed the pregnancy study and continued uh, exposing pregnant, pregnant women to these toxins. Uh, and in fact, at one point it had removed women from the Teflon division. You may recall that Sue said that uh, in the video. It actually moved women back into the Teflon division uh, af after finding the birth defects in the women. So Bailey's experience is part of a much larger story, a story that spans more than half a century and affects basically every person on the planet. Uh, since the 1950s, DuPont has has amassed reams of data showing that C8 causes cancer, birth defects, and numerous other diseases. But the, comp the company has buried these findings and continued marketing Teflon to the public. It's also dumped millions of pounds of C8 sludge in and around public water supplies. After the birth defect studies, DuPont became concerned about the effects this was having on the Parkersburg community and it actually had employees go out and secretly collect water from gas stations and general stores around the Parkersburg plant. Uh, and this water was then used for testing. Now, the test revealed that the water was heavily contaminated with C8, but DuPont suppressed these findings too. And it would continue contaminating the water in this community for more than two decades. In the meantime, Teflon grew into a billion dollar a year business for DuPont, and C8 spread around the globe. It's been detected in ringed seals in Greenland, beluga whales in the Canadian Arctic, bottlenose dolphins in the Caribbean, and children in the remote Faroe Islands. It's also been found in beef and apples in American grocery stores. One analysis of C8 from banks where they store blood around the world, found that almost all of it contained C8. In fact, the only blood they could find that didn't contain this chemical was archived samples from Korean war vets that was collected in the 1950s. Now think about that for a second. I can virtually guarantee that every person in this room has C8 in their blood. The chemical is associated with, the, with some serious health problems. There have been studies of Parkersburg residents that have linked C8 to six conditions, testicular cancer, kidney cancer, thyroid disease, high cholesterol, um, and pregnancy-induced hypertension. Scientists have also found that the chemical suppresses the immune system and, and reduces the effectiveness of childhood vaccines. And it has many of these effects at the levels that all of us have in our blood. Interestingly, we only know about C8's health effects, or its existence really, because of a legal battle between DuPont and the Tennant family. And these are two of the only remaining members of the Tennant family, uh, Jim and Della Tennant. Now the Tennants own a farm near Sue Bailey's hometown of Parkersburg. In the 1980s, they sold DuPont some land for a landfill. And after this happened, their cows started vomiting blood. Uh, and falling ill and dying, essentially. Within about a decade, they'd lost 280 head of cattle, and many members of the family started, started falling ill. So the tenants eventually filed suit against DuPont, and documents released as part of their litigation showed that DuPont had knowingly contaminated the drinking water. It also revealed that, that DuPont had covered up the health effects of C8 for decades. So the, the tenants eventually settled their case, but based on the documents they unearthed, there was a class action lawsuit involving 80,000 Parkersburg residents whose, whose water was contaminated, and the EPA filed a landmark lawsuit, which alleged that DuPont had, had covered up the health effects of a C8. The case was eventually settled and resulted in a $16.5 million fine. That was the largest fine in the agency's history. And it may seem like a lot of money, but it's nothing compared to the $1 billion a year that DuPont was making on C8. More importantly, under the terms of the settlement, the company wasn't even required to pull C8 from the market. The best the EPA could negotiate was a voluntary phase out over the next decade. So the situation in Parkersburg is emblematic of a larger problem. Most people presume that the chemicals that we use are tested for safety. In fact, only a handful of the 80,000 chemicals in circulation in the United States have ever undergone any kinds of safety testing. 
Why is this? Because our regulatory system presumes chemicals are safe until proven otherwise, and it puts the burden of establishing harm on the public. It also makes it extremely difficult to ban chemicals that are proven harmful. So in its entire 40-year history, the EPA has only ever banned five chemicals. In the case of C8, uh, contamination is widespread. Hundreds of communities around, around the United States have contaminated water, but there's no agency charged with testing for contamination or for cleaning up water that's found to be contaminated. So some of you may have heard about the situation in Hoosick Falls, New York, and surrounding communities, including some in New Hampshire, I believe. Vermont, Vermont yes, I'm sorry. Um, so they recently discovered that their water was contaminated with C8, which is also called PFOA or PFOA. So here's how Hoosick Falls learned that its water was contaminated with C8. There's a man named Michael Hickey, and in 2013, his father died of kidney cancer. Hickey's father had worked part-time at the local chemical factory. Uh, the factory made Teflon-coated fabric, and Hickey suspected that his job might have had something to do uh, with his illness. So one day, Hickey sat down, and he Googled Teflon and C8. I'm sorry, he Googled Teflon and kidney cancer. Um, and he ended up finding the study from Parkersburg, there was an epidemiological study um, that had connected C8 to kidney cancer. So Hickey then went about trying to persuade the EPA and local officials to test his water supply for C8, to test the community's water supply for C8. Um, and after a year of, of trying unsuccessfully to do that, he actually commissioned his own study, which showed the water was heavily contaminated. So. The question is how we ended up in a situation where the job of policing our air and our waterway falls to ordinary citizens like Michael Hickey. The conundrum dates back to the battle over leaded gasoline, some of which is chronicled in a book that the historians in the room may know. It's called Denial and Deceit, and it's by historians Gerald Markowitz and David Rosner. Now, after World War II, the DuPont Company, which up until this point specialized in gunpowder, began aggressively expanding into other industries, including chemicals. It also staged a hostile takeover over, of General Motors, which was uh, then a fledgling automaker. After the takeover, GM, GM came under intense pressure to, the research department of GM came under intense, intense pressure to develop profit-making innovations. And a young scientist named Thomas Midgley began looking for an additive that would quiet the knocking that was common in car engines at the time. Eventually, he found two substances that did the job. One was ethanol, or grain alcohol. The other was a substance called tetraethyl lead. Unlike ethanol, which was plentiful and easy to make, the leaded formula could be patented, meaning DuPont and his, its subsidiaries would profit on every gallon. Of course, there's a downside to lead. It's a potent neurotoxin. And almost as soon as leaded gasoline went onto the market, workers in the blending plants started collapsing on the factory floor or going stark raving mad. Uh, there were workers hurling themselves out of second floor windows. There were workers being hauled away in straitjackets. One man began running around the blending plant in terror, screaming, there are three coming at me at once. <coughs> And by October 1923, uh, 18 workers at DuPont's plant and a related plant by Standard Oil had died, and New, New York and New Jersey had banned leaded gasoline. And DuPont did everything it could to, there was also talk about a national ban on leaded gasoline. DuPont did everything it could to contain the damage. Shortly after the deaths became public, it called a press conference at its Deepwater, New Jersey plant. Midgley, who was actually had just been on a long leave of absence to recover from his own bout of lead poisoning, uh, <laughs> assured attendees that leaded gasoline was harmless and then proceeded to wash his hands with tetraethyl lead. At this point, DuPont also hired a young pathologist named Robert Kehoe. Um, his charge was studying the health effects of leaded gasoline and forging a strategy for keeping it on the market. And he was very effective at this job. The following spring, the Surgeon General called a hearing uh, on the safety of leaded gasoline. Scientists and public health officials called for banning the stuff until it could be tested for safety. Uh, industry officials argued that this would be disastrous for America's industrial progress. 
and they claimed the, the recent rash of factory deaths was due to worker carelessness and that there was really little harm to the American public. But it was Kehoe's testimony that had the greatest impact. So Kehoe <coughs> argued that there was no sense in banning novel products uh, unless there was de definitive proof of what he called an actual danger to the public. If we erred on the side of caution, he maintained, society might lose out on some valuable innovations. In the end, the Surgeon General accepted Kehoe's premise and found there was no good grounds for banning leaded gasoline. The, la the rationale laid out in his report very closely echoed the arguments that Kehoe had made. This uh, opened the, the, the door to the widespread sale of leaded gasoline. But more importantly, it established the Kehoe Principle, what is called the Kehoe Principle, as the bedrock of our regulatory system. This principle assumes that products are presumed are safe until proven otherwise, and it puts the burden of establishing harm on the public, which is why dirty, dangerous industries like asbestos and big tobacco have managed to escape regulation for decades. All they have to do is create the illusion of scientific uncertainty. Now, Kehoe was also a pioneer when it came to distorting science to protect profits. After the Surgeon General's hearing, he was named founding director of Kettering Laboratory at, since, at the University of Cincinnati. This was an ostensibly independent lab, but it was funded by DuPont. And Kehoe's research there focused on leaded gasoline, which he found was not harmful to human health. Because he was the only scientist doing work in this arena at the time, regulators were completely dependent on his findings, which is the main reason that leaded gasoline remained on the market for 60 years. Of course, we now know that Kehoe's findings were dead wrong. Leaded gasoline is associated with all kinds of health problems, including cancer, asthma, heart disease, liver problems, and perhaps most importantly, impaired cognitive development in children. So after World War II, Kehoe's strategies began spreading to other industries, starting with the plastics and chemical industry, and there's, there's a reason for this. During the war, chemical companies had dramatically expanded their production lines to meet the demands of global warfare. They also developed and refined a host of products, products like DDT, chemical fertilizers, fiberglass, acrylic, cling wrap, and Teflon. In the mid-1940s, they began laying plans to bring these products to the broader American public. And the goal wasn't merely to satisfy pent-up demand, although that certainly played a role. Just before the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, a DuPont executive named J.W. McCoy spoke at a manufacturer's conference. He predicted that America was entering a golden era, one where consumers' hunger for goods would fuel an upward spiral of productivity. But he warned, a satisfied public is a stagnant public. Manufacturers must see to it that Americans are never satisfied. In the years that followed, the plastics industry worked to cultivate into impulse buying and a shift towards disposable products. This is, we see, the, we see these trends um, persist in our culture today. And at one point, the, the trade journal Modern Plastics wrote, the future of plastics is in the garbage can. This was in the 1950s. This is an ad from Life, Ma I'm sorry, this is an, a picture from an article in Life magazine in 1955, it was called Throwaway Living, and you'll note the celebratory tone. So during this era, the market for plastics and pesticides and other chemical-based ba products exploded. Plastics production increased a thousandfold in the three decades after World War II. And the chemical revolution brought tens of thousands of untested chemicals into American homes, and not all of them were benign. So, as early as the 1950s, a group of Columbia University scientists began uh, exposing rats to some of these novel plastics like Teflon and acrylic and, and saran wrap. And they found that the, the rats developed cancer at astronomical rates. Um, by this point, some scientists were also t taking note of the fact that the pesticide DDT was causing die-offs in birds and fish. Some lawmakers began to worry about all of these untested chemicals in our food supply. And a, a Democratic congressman named James Delaney was among them. Delaney blasted the existing food law, which had no protections against chemicals, as, quote, a tragic legal joker that permits us to become a nation of 150 million guinea pigs, guilelessly testing out chemicals that should have been tested adequately before they reached our kitchen shelves. 
In 1951, uh, Delaney formed a committee to investigate these substances and craft regulations to better protect the public. The industry fought to block him, and in 1952, it hired Hill and Knowlton. Now, some of you may know the name Hill and Knowlton because Hill and Knowlton was the architect of Big Tobacco's War on Science. Um, but it actually deployed many of the ta tactics that would, that would later come to define big tobacco in service of the plastics and chemical industries. So it built an elaborate 50-state political operation. It distributed pro-plastics materials to tens of thousands oops, of public school classrooms. This is actually a memo from the Chemical Manufacturers Association uh, meeting minutes in 1957 that talks about the effort to distribute pro-industry curricula in public schools. The industry also hired scientists to challenge the research linking chemicals and plastics to various diseases. Now, the industry's chief scientific advisor during this period is a man whose name should now be familiar to you, Robert Kehoe. Kehoe made it its mission to persuade Congress that all chemicals were safe, perhaps even beneficial, in low enough doses. The solution, in his view, was not regulation, but more research to find the optimal dose. This ran directly counter to the testimony of another man. This is a German-born pathologist. His name is William Hooper. Hooper was then head of the Environmental Cancer Division at the National Cancer Institute. Most people have never heard of Hooper, uh, but his groundbreaking work linking many common chemicals to cancer was a key inspiration for Rachel Carson, whose book, Silent Spring, is credited with launching the environmental movement. In his testimony before Congress, uh, for the Delaney Committee specifically, Hooper stated that the age-old adage about the dose making the poison did not apply to cancer-causing chemicals, that basically even trace amounts of these substances could cause devastating health effects down the line. The industry responded by viciously attacking Hooper. At one point, DuPont even tried to persuade the FBI that Hooper um, was an active member of the Nazi party. At another point, they tried to persuade his employer that he was a communist, and during this era, that could end a person's career, and in fact, these tactics eventually would end Hooper's career. Um, Hooper would also later claim that, um, that his supervisors were sending his papers to DuPont for editing and approval, and uh, towards, towards the later part of his career, he had a uh, very difficult time publishing his data on the carcinogenic effects of chemicals. At any rate, in the end, this PR assault worked. When Congress passed the Food Additives Bill in 1958, chemicals already in commerce were presumed safe and grandfathered in. Now, by the 1950s, Congress, I'm sorry, by the 1970s, Congress is once again debating how to regulate these chemicals, which by this time were everywhere in our homes and lives. Both houses drafted laws that would have given the EPA the power to test and, and regulate these, these, pro, these substances, but the industry unleashed another lobbying blitz, and under the final version of the Toxic Substances Control Act, existing chemicals were once again grandfathered in. Man manufacturers did have to inform the EPA when they introduced a new chemical, but no testing was required, which is why the vast majority of the chemicals on the market have never undergone any safety testing. One of the most egregious examples of this is vinyl chloride, which is the chemical that's used to make saran wrap and the plastic known as vinyl or PVC. Since the 1970s, manufacturers have collected an abundance of data um, showing it caused serious health problems, particularly in workers, and particularly a, a rare but very deadly form of liver cancer. But chemical companies, and I'm talking about companies like DuPont, BF Goodrich, Monsanto, DuPont, conspired for decades to suppress these findings. Meanwhile, many PVC factory workers uh, died of liver cancer or other vinyl chloride-linked diseases. In some cases, the plastic industry has, has relied on the very same consultants who Big, who Big Tobacco used to, uh, to wage war on science. In the 1990s, for example, academic researchers began to connect um, the estrogen mimicking chemical BPA to a long list of health problems, among them cancer, diabetes, genital deformities, obesity, ADHD. And BPA, by the way, is found in many pr plastic products. It's also found in the lining of tin cans, um, on cash register receipts. So it, it remains ubiquitous to this day. 
In response to the findings on BPA, the industry hired the Weinberg Group. Now, the Weinberg Group calls itself a product defense consultant. Uh, and it's best known for heading up the White Coat Project, which was a project by the tobacco industry to cast out, actually to, to enlist scientists to cast out on the research linking secondhand smoke to disease. In the 1990s, Weinberg started working with the plastic industry on BPA, which is, at the time was found in almost every baby bottle and sippy cup. It, uh, it actually hired scientists to produce studies on BPA. It underwrote a scientific journal that, that published these studies and other studies that were beneficial to the chemical industry. Now, how biased were these studies? Well, at this point, BPA is the most studied chemical on the planet. There are more than 100 published studies uh, by academic scientists. Almost all of them have found dramatic effects. On the other hand, not a single industry-funded study has found that BPA is harmful. Weinberg has done similar work for other chemical companies. This is a solicitation letter the company sent DuPont after the EPA launched its investigation on C8 in 2003. The second paragraph reads, for 23 years, the Weinberg Group has helped numerous companies manage issues allegedly related to environmental exposures. Beginning with Agent Orange in 1983, we have successfully guided clients through myriad regulatory litigation and public relations challenges posed by those whose agenda is to grossly overregulate. The letter goes on to say, right there, and I don't know if you can read it, um, from where you sit, but we will harness, focus, and involve the scientific and intellectual capital of our company with one goal in mind, creating the outcome our client desires. And the letter also notes that uh, Weinberg has dozens of scientists on staff who, whose mission is apparently to create the outcome that the client desires. So all of which begs the question, is science for sale? In my reporting, I also found a detailed case history or a detailed list of case histories for Hill and Knowlton. I won't go into specifics here, but the cover sheet lists some of the chemicals that have been targets of Hill and Knowlton's misinformation campaigns, among them vinyl chloride. I should say it's not just chemicals, it's also other substances. Vinyl chloride, asbestos, dioxin, which is an extremely toxic class of, ke class of chemicals, and chlorinated fluorocarbons, or CFCs, which were the cause of the ozone hole, which was a big deal in the, in the 1980s. And incidentally, CFCs were also invented by Thomas Midgley, who uh, brought us leaded gasoline. No other scientist has done quite as much to destroy the planet as Thomas Midgley. So these tactics used by these industries have been remarkably effective. But in a few cases, the industry uh, has lost control of the narrative and has been forced to remove a given chemical from the market. However, under our current system, which presumes chemicals are safe, uh, they aren't required to test the replacement chemical to ensure that it doesn't have the same effects. So this has led to a ph phenomenon that, that environmental groups refer to as regrettable substitution, meaning that companies that come under pressure to get rid of one toxic substance basically often replace it with another substance that has similar health effects. I've written an entire story about BPA-free plastics. These plastics are marketed as the safe alternative to plastics containing BPA. In reality, many of them have the very same qualities that make BPA so harmful. Another prime example is C8. So last year, DuPont finally phased C8 as part of its uh, 2000, phased out C8 as part of its 2005 agreement with the EPA. Uh, but the chemical they're using in place of C8 have very similar qualities. They're similar in terms of their chemical structure, and the limited data that's available suggests they have similar health effects. Uh, the data is concerning enough to scientists that last May, 200 chemists, toxicologists, and epidemiologists from around the world signed a statement urging governments around the world to restrict all of these chemicals because of the risk of, the risk of adverse effects on human health and the environment. Now, until that happens, these substances will continue spreading into our air and water. Not long ago, a group of researchers uh, dug up some worms from one of the aquifers surrounding the Park Parkersburg plant, where the water supply is produced. And they found a number of C8's chemical cousins in, in the aquifer, chemicals like C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, and C10. Um, 
What this means is that Parkersburg residents are still being used as guinea pigs for chemicals whose effect on human health is unknown. Meanwhile, many people in the community are still fighting to get justice for the C8 contamination. More than 3,500 Parkersburg residents currently have individual liability lawsuits pending against DuPont. These are people who became sick with the illnesses who have been, that have been linked to C8 after drinking the C8 contaminated water. Um, there are also a handful of suits from former employees of the company. Among them is a man named Ken Wamsley. Wamsley was a technician, uh, a lab technician at the Parkersburg plant. So there's a lab on site at the plant that does stress testing um, and quality control on the pro all the products that the plant produces. Uh, after the birth defects study, the DuPont appointed one person per shift to do testing on Teflon and other products that contain C8. And Wamsley believes this is because they wanted to limit the number of employees who were exposed to the chemical. Almost all of the other workers who were given this task all of the other designated C8 testers um, died prematurely. So Ken Wamsley is the last surviving one. And I'm gonna close with his story because I think it drives home the stakes of this vast, unregulated chemical landscape that we all live in. All right, thank you all. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, does anyone have questions? Okay. Yes, please wait for the microphone. Gentleman in the blue shirt, please. Yes. Um, I guess I have lots of questions, but I'll try to limit it to what I find might be most useful or important. Are there agencies or groups defending other countries before these plastics become en masse there as well? Or does Europe have a, do a better job at preventing their landscape from being contaminated? That's a very good question. Um, so the European system worked very much like our system until 2006. In 2006, the European Union passed a law um, that, that created what is, they, they've moved, that created what is called, a system governed by what is called the precautionary principle. Uh, the precautionary principle um, dictates that rather than, rather than waiting for all the scientists, science to accumulate, you, you, if there's evidence that a product is harmful, you ban it. And so the European Union is now in the process of systematically vetting 140,000 chemicals, I believe, for safety. So it's a slow, uh, arduous process, but, but they are actually systematically accumulating data, uh, and, and it's becoming clear that, that many product, many chemicals that are very common in the United States have some very toxic properties based on the research they're doing there. Also, France has banned BPA. So there are, there are also states that are doing this. California, for example, has created a list of chemicals of concern, um, including, including things like C8 and BPA. And they are systematically testing those chemicals, and those chemicals will potentially be banned in California. Now, if that happens, uh, it will almost be a de facto national ban because California is such a huge economy. Manufacturers can't afford to be shut out of that market. So I'm going to say one more thing about this. Now, the interesting thing is there's currently a battle over reforming the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, and environmental groups have been pushing for a system more similar to the European Union. Uh, but, in, but the industry has actually spent record sums lobbying to block this and to water down existing safeguards. And the version of the Toxic Substances Control Act that passed, that passed the House, I believe it was in 2015, uh, would actually preempt state laws. So really, the only curbs we have on toxic chemicals in this country come from state level laws, states like Maine and California uh, that have more restrictive laws. So 
those laws could be nullified uh, under, under the revised Toxic Substances <coughs> Control Act. So we're actually potentially moving further away from the European model rather than closer to the European model. Yes, sir. Could you comment on the AIMS test and why that doesn't raise more questions about some of these substances? What is the AIMS test? It was a bacteriologist who, who screened all kinds of chemicals and... and oh, yes, okay. Um, so there are a variety of ways. There are a variety of ways to screen chemicals. Um, you can do it with computer modeling. You can do it with cancer cells. There's a variety of cell-based tests. There are, yeah, the AIMS test. So there are a variety of ways to screen chemicals. Uh, and I think the thing is that, that efforts to systematically screen chemicals get bogged down in political wrangling. So there's a, there's a, there's a program at the EPA that's supposed to test all endocrine disrupting chemicals, and it was supposed to report back by 2001. It hasn't fully vetted a single chemical by now. And this is partially because the way these agencies work is they want all stakeholders at the table, so you have industry representatives who bog down the process is essentially what happens. The, it's a very democratic process, which makes it open to, and, and there's a lot of emphasis on consensus, which makes it vulnerable to sandbagging. Yes. Um. How many of these chemicals that you've investigated can be filtered out from the environment by normal things like water filters, or is, and is there anything else normal that individuals can do to avoid being exposed to these chemicals as much? I'm not sure I know the, the answer to that question, um, whether, they're, whether they're filtered out. There are, so there are certain kinds of charcoal filters that can filter out C8. And they are, they are installing these in certain communities. But whether your Brita filter would do the same thing, I, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, in terms of ways to avoid exposure to these chemicals, there are certain things that, that cause plastics, in particular, to release chemicals. And that is UV rays, um, heat, and steam. So putting them in a dishwasher, putting them in a microwave, boiling them, or leaving them out in the sun increases the likelihood that they will leach these chemicals. However, not doing that doesn't guarantee they won't leach these chemicals, but you can, you can reduce your risk somewhat. Um, yeah, beyond that, I wish I had better answers for you, but I don't, unfortunately. Yes, sir. Um, I, I have a, a kind of general question, but it relates to a very specific question, so I'll put them together, and one is this issue of the burden of proof, innocent until proven guilty, good until proven definitively scientifically harmful, and that Kehoe, Kehoe strategy, was it? which is, um, of course, you know, you mentioned science for hire. It takes science to contest science. And then you say, what's definitive science? And that's a very hard one to deal with. And you say, well, science for hire is not definitive science because you can hire other scientists. But my question is, do you think that the public's uh, acceptance of the be innocent until proven guilty benefit of the doubt is on the side of innovation, it's harmless until it's really proven harmful, is actually shifting? Because I, I do think Europe Europe tends to be more skeptical about GMO. It's ske more skeptical about atomic energy. Uh, it's more skeptical about a lot of things, and that's because of its history, just like we're less skeptical because of our history. But do you think, and the specific issue that I'm bringing up is fracking. I was told, I don't, I'm a layman, don't know anything about it, but that the formula for the chemicals that are used in the fracking procedures are kept secret, just like the food industry doesn't want GMO to be put on food, at least in Vermont and elsewhere, because they say, well, people are fearful if they have something that looks like a warning, they're going to not want to buy it or consume it. And it does seem to me that some of these procedures, like fracking, are so massive in their scale 
that the whole issue of raising doubts about it would actually probably, but of course then there's kind of an ulterior foreign policy issue, which is energy independence. We should develop our own energy supply so we're not dependent on unstable, uh, you, you know, Middle East. Yeah. So, you know, there's all these layers of politics and policy, but do you think the benefit, I mean, the, the burden of proof thing is shifting with the public in its assessments? I don't think that the public thinks a whole lot about this issue. Fracking, <coughs> fracking is something that hits closer to home for a lot of people because it's their, you know, their drinking water. I think that, that people who would not necessarily um, be as concerned about issues like chemical safety, you know, it crosses political lines in a way that I find is, is very interesting. So it's you know, Republicans and Democrats, it's, it's, I think the concern about fracking stems from a different set of issues than, you know, concern about chemical safety necessarily would. So I don't, I don't think when it comes to chemical safety that most people even realize that there's as little regulation as there is or that, um, that the burden of proof is such that, that the, that it's up to, the public essentially to prove that a, that a chemical is harmful. So, so just to put a point on it, it's kind of like the burden of proof is not shifting because of the NIMBY principle, not in my backyard. If there's fracking, it should be in North Dakota. Uh, but I guess Pennsylvania and New York have banned it, isn't that? Or New York has banned it, I believe. Yeah, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I think that, that, that fracking is maybe I, I am not aware of these sort of scientific misinformation campaigns surrounding fracking. I mean, fracking is is largely unregulated, um, and and most of the chemicals are kept secret. We just don't know very much about what's being pumped into the ground. I so I but I, to tell to tell you the truth, I know less about fracking. So, um, but I, at least on the chemical front, I don't think there has been a shift in terms of um, in terms of what the public wants for burden of proof. Um, I think you've identified uh, three different types of exposures um, from chemicals. One would be people who are involved in the manufacturing mm -hmm. of it, people who um, use um, water, drinking water, where there's been contamination. And third, there have been, um, you mentioned products like plastics. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about those risks as being um, quite varied because, um, you know, when you started talking, I felt like going home and throwing out the saran wrap. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> on that last, in that last group of exposures, um, you know, what, first of all, what do you think of my idea of well, segregating that. I think and the third, uh, in following that up is, how does this square with the fact that over the same period of chemical exposure, we've seen some significant rises in life expectancy in the general population? So yeah. I'm not sure how much yeah. no, it's, it's, of danger so, that is. Um, I guess I will answer the first question first. It depends on the chemical. So different, so toxicologists talk about this notion of the dose makes the poison. And for toxins, for pure toxins, that is the case, right? So the, the higher your level exposure, the more damage it does. That is not necessarily the case for all chemicals. So in particular, endocrine disruptors, chemicals that mimic human hormones, they found that they can sometimes even have more dramatic effects at lower levels and they're harmful. I mean, basically there appears to be no safe level of exposure to a chemical like BPA. Uh, and, and at this point, you know, for example, the, am the animal data on BPA suggests that it can cause a lot of these effects at levels that the average human being has in their blood. And now in terms of the life expectancy, Yes, the life expectancy, I think the, the increased life expectancy is largely due to medical advances. Um, at the same time, you have increased rates of a number of diseases that are linked, particularly with endocrine disrupting chemicals like BPA. So 
diabetes, heart disease, breast cancer, prostate cancer. If you look at, and in fact, I think the Endocrine Society recently released a statement um, that talked about how the rise of certain diseases tracks very closely with the rise of endocrine disrupting chemicals in the environment. So um, obviously it's not possible to make a one to one correlation. Now the, the rate of death, for example, if you take breast cancer, the rate of death from breast cancer is lower than it once was because the medical interventions are more successful, but more people are, are getting the disease, if you understand the distinction I'm making. Is this on? Okay. Uh, is it possible for you to elaborate on how these companies suppress like these documents and studies and stuff? Do they just not share it? Yeah, in a lot of cases. So in the case of DuPont, for example, they have uh, DuPont and, and 3M, which was originally the manufacturer of C8. They have these huge staffs of scientists who are doing this, this, the research, so they are they are conducting the research and just not sharing the data externally. Now, there are a lot of cases where they also hire um, scientists that, that have a history of working with big tobacco uh, or other industries who then design studies that are essentially engineered not to find health effects. And um, that happened quite a bit with BPA and with BPA-free chemicals. So. Um, sometimes when questions are raised about the safety of a given chemical or product, they then enlist scientists um, external to the company to produce and publish studies uh, that, that if you look closely are, are biased. Hi. Uh, first, Alexis. really, really interesting presentation. Thank you. I'm curious how you got access to some of those documents that were so indicting of the company. Um, how did you get, oh, sorry. I'm just curious how you got access to some of those internal memorandum uh, that were particularly indicting about the company's behavior and how long it knew what it knew. So this is thanks to the tenant family um, and, and the subsequent litigation. And that, that is the only way I'm able to tell this internal story. There has been, in the last two decades, there's been a number of lawsuits involving uh, vinyl chloride, involving um, BPA-free plastics, and involving, you know, involving a variety of these chemicals, but particularly C8. So, so the documents that I have are largely as a result of discovery in the tenant case. Uh, and the tenant case is actually really interesting because the lawyer that they worked with was a corporate attorney who had represented chemical companies beforehand. And uh, some of you, I don't know if you, anybody read it, but there's actually a story about the lawyer in the New York Times Magazine that came out about six months after, after my article. Um, and he, after the case was settled, most attorneys, especially attorneys in his position who, you know, he had an incentive not to piss off the industry, would have walked away. But instead, he spent several months writing this 972-page letter to the EPA that laid out everything he'd found about this conspiracy, and he attached all these documents. So, um, and then he continued over the course of years, and he's still doing it, putting together these, these letters with all these documents attached. So actually, the, the documents are not in the public record. You're able to get a lot more documents than you normally would in the case of the lawsuit. And I, uh, the way I got them was I went to the EPA docket center and I just spent a day digging through the files and found thousands and thousands of pages of documents. But this is, you know, it's an extraordinary circumstance. So the same thing in terms of um, vinyl chloride, there were lawsuits by formal, former vinyl workers and um, Markowitz, yeah, Gerald Markowitz and Rosner, these two historians, um, got access to the docket because they were asked to testify as experts and they wrote, they wrote the book to see in denial, which if people are interested in this issue is completely fascinating. So that, um, you know, it's similar to the, to the tobacco industry. All of these internal documents came out through litigation and you're able, able to retroactively reconstruct 
these campaigns. And that's really, that's my project at the moment. So that's you know, what I'm planning to do with the book project is really to delve into these archives deeper and try to piece together how this campaign <coughs> evolved, dating back to, to Robert Kehoe. So, yes, sir. Uh, I just did a comment to make rather than a question. Uh, here at this uh, institution of higher learning, uh, we rarely have the occasion to see such fantastic scholarship in the service of an absolutely urgent question for America. Thank you very much. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. I'm, I'm touched by that. Thank you. Um, are these lawsuits by workers against the factories and the companies, are they based on at least one of the facts that they're not properly warned about the risks of working there? Yes. So in the case of the tenants, uh, the tenants sold DuPont some land for a landfill. And afterwards, as I described, the cows started dying. So, um, and they were convinced that it was something in the landfill. They didn't know what. And they struggled for more than a decade to get regulators to intervene. And there's like a whole very interesting backstory about how DuPont managed to uh, manipulate the process in a way that, that avoided any genuine scrutiny. And then they were unable to find an attorney who would take their case locally, and they eventually connected with this, with this Cincinnati attorney and filed a lawsuit. Um, in the case of the factory workers who, who have filed suit, and this is less the case in Parkersburg, um, but elsewhere with PVC, there are people who are sick um, have, have usually fatal diseases that they developed as, res as a result of exposure to chemicals that the company knew was harmful but didn't disclose to workers was harmful. So um, most of the PVC workers who filed suit have since died. They died of brain cancer and liver cancer, these very rare, this rare, very rare form of liver cancer um, that the company knew was caused by the chemical and the company knew was making workers sick. Yes, sir. Yes, um, in that light, has there been any criminal charges <laughs> against any of these companies or? No, there has not. So uh, the Justice Department did actually launch a probe against DuPont uh, after the C8 revelations came to light, but nothing came of it. There was, you know, there was a press release and they won't comment on ongoing investigations. They wouldn't tell me whether the investigation was ongoing or not, but it's been a decade and nothing has come of it. So as far as I know, there has not been any criminal charges. And I mean, in the case of DuPont, this is something that I, it may manage to escape liability entirely. So there have been three separate uh, batches of lawsuits, essentially. There was the tenant lawsuit, then there was a, a class action lawsuit which ended in this landmark settlement. Um, and now there's all these individual liability lawsuits. And um, the first of them, the first of the bellwether cases, which is supposed to determine the outcome of all the cases, there's five bellwethers, was tried in October. Um, it was a woman who developed kidney cancer and she was awarded $1.6 million. So, you know, multiply that by 80,000 people who have, who are eligible to file individual liability lawsuits and the, and the potential damages are staggering. But DuPont recently spun off its specialty chemical division into a separate firm called Chemors, which now has all the liability and, and has a fraction of DuPont's income. And now DuPont is merging with Dow Chemical um, and they're going to split off into three or six separate companies. So um, even, if, even if a court were to rule that Chemours is not liable and DuPont is actually liable, it, will be, it could be very difficult for the people who have been harmed by C8 to actually ever uh, receive compensation for their illnesses. You know, and these are all people, all the people who are suing are people who have very serious diseases that have been pretty definitively linked to C8 
uh, through an epidemiological study of the community itself. So the, the, it's very unusual for, for an epidemiological study to draw these kinds of connections, but because the number of people in the community that participated, they, they were able to establish what they called a probable link between C8 and these, these six diseases. Um, so now that we're armed with this kind of information about the chemicals, what sorts of measures would you suggest taking for like day-to-day -day things to reduce the impact of these chemicals on our lives? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, and as, a, as I was saying before the talk, I had a three-year-old son when I first started reporting on this topic and children are particularly vulnerable um, because it, uh, hormone altering chemicals in particular uh, affect the development of organs in the way that set you up for disease later on in life. And they, anyways, it's, it's been a huge concern of mine and I've, I've been flooded with emails from readers who want to know and I wish I had better answers for people. Uh, but really there's, because we don't know, most of us don't even know what kind of plastic we're using. We don't know, and even if you do, you don't know what chemicals are in it. So, I mean, what I have done personally is I have limited the plastics that I use as much as possible. I use glass Tupperware. I, I use a stainless steel travel coffee mug. Um, I don't, when I get it to go coffee, I don't get the lid because that's made of polystyrene, which is a probable human carcinogen. Um, but I still buy cheese and meat that's wrapped in plastic. There's just no way to entirely avoid it. So, I mean, I guess the only advice I can offer is to avoid um, the things that I talked about before that increase the likelihood of chemicals leaching out of plastic. So heat, uh, steam, and UV rays, and to you know reduce plastic as much as possible. I should say that it depends on what stage of life you're in. So um, a lot of these chemicals are particularly harmful to developing fetuses and to small children. Um, so if you're in childbearing age, it's of more concern. If you are done having children, um, if you're, you know, for the older people in the audience, the effects of a lot of these chemicals are, you know, are less dramatic um, on adults than they are on younger people for what, for what that's worth. I wish I had a better answer for you. Thank you. Um, you should be a journalist. You like <laughs> to ask questions. <laughs> How does this make you feel about like humanity? Does it make you feel like hopeless or anything? So I have to say that, that working on the Parkersburg story actually made me feel more hopeful about humanity than just about anything I've done in my career as a journalist. And the reason is because these individuals, the tenant family, the teacher who filed the class action lawsuit, um, they stood up against DuPont, against tremendous odds. They were ostracized by their own community. And as a result of what they did, um, this chemical has been phased out, and we, we all know about its existence. So um, it's easy to become pessimistic, but people, you know, people like this actually give me a lot of hope. So um, I really, really admire these people. You know, some of them have like fourth or fifth grade educations, but they've, they've changed the world, so. Thanks. Uh, I have a quick question about, um, about advice for young aspiring journalists who are interested in maybe following your footsteps and reporting on this, this type of topic. I mean, corporations are probably going to outlive everyone in this room, <laughs> and yeah. they're going to switch names, and they're going to switch tactics. And so I'm curious if you have any advice for, like I said, the next generation of people. And because this seems to be a very resource intensive endeavor, yeah. where do you find the resources to, to chase these things down to spend a day, if not weeks, in an archive are, are digging through documents? Are you in class by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just definitely thinking about taking it. So. Um, so this is a harder and harder question to answer. Um, so I, I did this story as a freelancer, 
And the way that I am able to do that is I get grants to fund my reporting. And there are a few foundations out there that are very generous about giving grants. They're eager to give grants to young reporters who are just starting out. Um, one of them is the Nation Institute Investigative Fund. Another one is the Fund for Investigative Journalism. But if you search for grants for journalists, I mean, you, you want, they're, they're gonna wanna see that you have some sort of track record. Um, but you know, if you have ambitions, if you have ambitions of doing this kind of work, I would urge you to just try to navigate yourself in a position where you can, where you can do it, because it's, um, yeah, but that's, I mean, that is, that is the main way. When I've been on, you know, I've done a bunch of, I've done investigative stories on, on staff, but honestly, I, I feel, um, I really get the resources to do them the way that I really want to do them, and it's, you know, so finding an, and you obviously you get paid for a story like this, and I got a relatively good rate, but when you're investing the kind of time it takes to do a big media investigation, even if you get a good rate, it doesn't always add up financially. So, um, and you know, as young, younger journalists starting out, you know, it's harder and harder to find places that pay, um, that pay a living rate. Although it's the, although there are a lot of platforms out there, and I'd almost say it's like it's easier to find platforms that will actually publish your work. So if you can get grants to fund it, um, it's a you know it's 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 a it's a godsend for people who want to do ambitious stories. Um. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, w which organizations would you say are doing good work in this field? A lot of organizations are doing good work in this field. So my Parkersburg story was a finalist for the National Magazine Award. Um, I wrote it for the Huffington Post, Highline. Most people, most people associate the Huffington Post with side boob or you know, cat photos, but they do now. They have a long form project that's doing incredible work. Buzzfeed um, won in my category for the National Magazine Award. Uh, so, but you know, the, of course, the traditional outlets are, are also. There's a lot of places that are doing really good long-form journalism right now. There's sort of a rebirth of it. There's, um, and there's a lot of this sort of marriage of digital media and long-form journalism, which is super exciting. So I, I can't give you. There's a lot. I could give you a long list, but okay, there's uh, a lot of places that are doing good work. How about scientific organizations like the Environmental Working Group or the. The Environmental Working Group, in terms of the kind of the kind of issues I am reporting on, the Environmental Working Group is the best resource. They, I mean, they are actually the ones who exposed. They're the ones who brought widespread attention to BPA as an issue in 2008. They were the first organization to get involved in in trying to. Um, Expose some of what was happening in Parkersburg. So they are, you know, they're a small organization, but they do very, very good work uh, on on the chemical front. Um, I guess I was just wondering, would it ever be possible, or are there any initiatives to keep scientists objective, to keep scientists from being able to give data that that pleases the client? I mean, are there any, reg I mean, I realize it would be extremely hard to regulate something like that. It's just, I don't know, it's just astounding that, that scientists could be hired in that way to do such subjective, biased work. I, I don't know that I have a good answer to that question. I think changing, I think probably, the, in my opinion, the best way to address the problem is to change the incentive system because mm -hmm. right now the incentive is to create and magnify scientific uncertainty, right? And as mm -hmm. long as you can do that, you can avoid regulation. And they go about doing that all kinds of ways. Um, you know, it's challenging various kinds of, of screening tests. It's, you know, I mean, so basically, um, and it's a detriment to science and it's a detriment to public health. And I think, but I think as long as there, 
as long as there's an incentive for scientific misinformation, you're going to have scientific misinformation. I don't, you know, and the thing is, a lot of it is targeting the public, who is, you know, the general public is not necessarily savvy enough to distinguish between legitimate science and science that is designed to look legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we see that we see that conundrum playing out very dramatically in the case of, of climate change. Yeah. Okay, I think we're... Okay. Thank you all.